Okay, so I'll just give you a very brief rundown of um, the work that I've done, just to give you the context for my experience and what I've done, I guess, with, yeah, with your industry and tell you a little bit about Bugs for Bugs before we move to IPM itself. So I spent about six years working with a company called IPM Technologies. Some of you in the audience may be familiar with Bullhorn and Jessica Page. Um, the company's based in Victoria, but we, we worked um, across Australia and um, consulting internationally as well. So that was all applied entomology and essentially helping growers improve control of pests and reduce their reliance on insecticides. We, we also were doing um, IPM research and training. So um, combining that on-farm work with um, looking at, at all of the other bits and pieces that we need to understand to get IPM working in a wide range of crops. And it was during that time that I worked with both uh, Jason Shields and Brent Reeve uh, in their apple and pear crops to help them fine tune uh, what they were doing in their IPM programs. Since then, I went off and had a baby and I'm now working at Bugs for Bugs. I've been doing that for the last two years. Where I'm, I'm employed as an entomologist and IPM specialist and I, um, I work with, uh, yeah, I work in a technical support um, role there working with our customers across Australia. Uh, Bugs for Bugs, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, our company, we're, we're an Australian based company. We specialise in integrated pest management and the products that we supply um, include beneficial insects and mites, IPM tools, so various um, different items there from sticky traps um, through to, to other monitoring tools, pheromone products and things like that and also fruit fly management products. That's another area that we specialize in. And again, yeah, as a, as a company, we, we work directly with growers and also with resellers and other IPM consultants around Australia to support growers to develop IPM programs. Um, and this covers a, a very wide range of crops. So I'm not here as specifically as a, as a pear um, specialist. My, my, um, my experience is, is in a wide range of crops but with the help of Brent and Jason, I'll, I'll share the stories that I have from working in your industry and, the, um, and what's, what it's possible to achieve in, in that space. So, well, almost 70% of you are already practicing IPN, so I could probably skip this slide. But just to give you my, my um, brief definition of, of IPM, essentially it's using all available pest management options instead of relying only on pesticides. And there's a focus on biological and cultural controls. So these are the predators, parasites and pathogens of pests, those natural enemies, if you like, or beneficials, and the cultural controls, the management practices, that whole range of things that growers can do to influence um, pests within the orchard, pests or beneficials within the orchard. In IPM, we are, um, certainly aiming to use pesticides only as a support tool. So they're part of the program, we integrate them, but we see them as the, as the last resort rather than the first line of defence. And IPM is, it's an approach, it's not a recipe. So I'm not here to give you a recipe how to do um, IPM in, in um, pear orchards. Uh, I'm here to, to give you the principles and share some experience from growers that have done this very successfully. But decisions have to be made on each farm, in each season, on each block, um, based on the results of re regular monitoring, and that's monitoring for both pests and beneficials. So why, why not just rely on chemicals? I guess you're, you're here and you're, you're engaging in this, um, in this event because this is something that's of interest to you or it's something you're already working pretty hard to do, but I'll just throw some of those important um, reasons at you. Um, one of the, the, the primary reasons that we have people adopting IPM is because the, the pesticides that they've been relying on um, start working so that the, the issues with resistance and your, your industry has, has certainly seen plenty of that over the years. Um, we're also seeing pesticide products being withdrawn, either voluntarily withdrawn by the, the chemical companies that produce them or being withdrawn by government regulation. And the more we see that occurring overseas, um, that, you know, those, those, um, those, regulations that are also coming into effect in Australia or else if you're targeting export markets then then you need to abide by the rules overseas and so it's you know these as these things change on a global scale it's becoming relevant locally and driving uh, further attention to, to, to IPM and making it work well. The issue of residues in produce um, 
is is of course important um, and and where we see heavy reliance on chemicals, um, there's there's always the question about whether whether people are actually um, risking being caught with residues above MRLs. And worker and environmental safety, that's not usually the first reason that we have people coming to us and saying we want to adopt IPM, um, but it's certainly an, an added bonus. And with consumer concern around environmental safety, um, there's there's that added um, that 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 added pressure for growers to take this really seriously and, and adopt it. The last point there is about induced pests or pest flare. And this is, this is a really important point because if you're coming from a background where, um, where you've relied on chemicals um, or only made perhaps half-hearted attempts to adopt IPM, um, you may not, you may or may not be aware just how much damage you can actually do um, by applying pesticides that are that are inappropriate or perhaps. Um, actually causing uh, pest, pest flare and making, making things a lot harder for yourself. So I know certainly Jason is going to share some, some of his stories about um, those, the lessons he's learned about, about flaring pests and moving away from, from a whole lot of chemistry. So just to give you some um, very quick three examples from other industries, just to, just to take you outside of the, the um, the pear orchards and, and probably apples that you that you work in. Um, examples of, of some of these, you know, resistance and, and pest flare issues. This is from work um, done by my colleagues, Paul Horn and Jessica Page, when I was working at IPM Technologies. They, they were working with shallot growers in East Java who were spraying 90 to 150 insecticides in nine weeks on shallot crops that, and they were unable to, to kill an insecticide resistant pest called beet armyworm. So, this stuff doesn't just happen overseas. We see it in Australia as well. So in strawberries in the Yarra Valley, let's say about 10 years ago, perhaps a little longer now, um, plenty of crops were being sprayed every second day or daily for insecticide resistant Western flower thrips and mites. And in both of these cases, we've seen excellent adoption of IPM um, and a real turnaround in the reliance on sprays, but it's been this, these resistance issues that have really driven change. In, uh, in, in Werribee South, close, again, close to home for those of us um, in Victoria, um, this is the sort of damage caused by insecticide resistant diamondback moth in cabbages that were being sprayed with four insecticides every week from transplant to harvest. And when you're spraying that much um, insecticide and you're mixing selective products with cheap and nasty broad spectrum ones, what you end up with is pest flare. So in the, in the case of the cabbages, um, they were riddled with aphids. As a result, these aphid outbreaks were occurring because the natural enemies that normally control aphids in a crop like this were being killed by the sprays applied for diamondback moth. In, in, uh, in palm fruit, I, I can imagine that everybody can relate at least to, to the concept of, of pest flare when you think about mites. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, that's the, the primary example. But if you're experiencing problems with mealybugs, that's also very likely to be an induced pest that's occurring at the level that you're fighting it um, as a result of the sprays you're applying, sprays that are, are killing the, the beneficials that normally control those pests in the crops. So back to why we want to use IPM, we, we genuinely see growers achieving better pest control and better quality, particularly where there are insecticide resistant pests involved. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to achieve fewer insecticide applications and that's almost always the case. We see growers um, really pleased with, with the um, getting improved market access and they pull a whole lot of chemicals um, out of their spray programs. And we also um, can delay the development of insecticide resistance. So IPM is different to an insecticide resistance management strategy where you just rotate through every available chemical um, as, a, as a strategy to, to reduce the, or to delay the development of resistance. This is a strategy where we certainly focus on a more limited range of chemicals if we're using them, you know, those that we use, it's, we're not using everything. Um, but, but the fact that we're, we're reducing the number of applications um, is, is a really important tool to delay that development of resistance. And we can reduce the number of sprays that we're applying because we're relying on a whole range of different tools rather than just chemicals alone. I'm going to speak now about biological control. Uh, most insects and mites have natural enemies, the things that have evolved to, um, 
as their as their enemies, whether these be um, predators, parasites, or pathogens. And there are two complementary approaches to harnessing these natural enemies or biocontrol agents. The first is what we call conservation biocontrol, and this is this is really really important to understand. This is where we focus on preserving, attracting, and encouraging naturally occurring beneficials. And it's, it's all about managing the crop environment to create an improved habitat for beneficials. And often one of the first steps there is reviewing the spray program and taking out the things that, that, are, that are killing these organisms um, year after year in, in, you know, through, through the sprays that you're applying. The other, um, the, the other complementary approach is what we call augmentation by control. And this is where we release mass read beneficials. So companies like Bugs for Bugs, um, and, and there are a couple of other companies in Australia that produce by control agents. We, we rear them in an insectary and you can buy them and you can uh, release them in the crop. So there are over 30 species of beneficial insects and mites currently available in Australia. You might think, wow, so many tools, that's great. Um, but I'm here to tell you that that's a very small, very limited toolkit. Um, and and it's really important, even though I'm here speaking um, as I am, um, you know, I'm representing Bugs for Bugs, but I, but, but, uh, I can't emphasize enough how important it is for, for you to focus on that conservation by control aspect to make use of all the naturally occurring beneficials and see this, the augmentation by control that releases of, of, um, of predators or parasites as an additional tool. So, Conservation by control, I said it's all about creating the right environment um, and improved habitat for beneficials. Natural enemies simply won't thrive in a hostile environment. And if you take a look at the two pictures on the on the side of the slide there, this is these are um, almonds, and you can see two very different crop environments. The the crop environment at the top is pretty barren and there's not a lot of um, there's well there's zero biodiversity <laughs> plant wise in there there's just almonds and nothing else and um, and most beneficial insects and mites really struggle to survive in hot dry dusty environments all of those things have a negative impact um, on these these small organisms and you can imagine it's it's uh, that that top orchard doesn't support a lot of um, diversity uh, in terms of, of biocontrol agents. And really it's a fantastic place for pests of almonds to live, not a very good place for many other insects or mites to inhabit. If you compare that to the orchard on the bottom, this is, this is the sort of um, the, an example of, of an ideal sort of scenario in terms of conservation biocontrol where you can have, you know, you increase the biodiversity in the crop through having that um, that fantastic interrow um, cultivated with, with a mix of um, grasses and, and different broadleaf plants. The pollen provided by those plants supports um, beneficials and there's, there'll be other insects living in there which are also an alternative food source for beneficials. There's a whole lot going on pollen nectar. Um, also having that, that grass in the interrow there will help to buffer the extremes in temperature and, and humidity that can, that can affect um, these small organisms that we rely on. So they can be supported by that and simply having that, that ground cover also reduces dust in the orchard. So, so interrow management in, when we're talking about tree and vine crops is a really, really important area of cultural control where we can really influence um, whether or not biocontrol agents thrive and do a good job. So I think, yes, monocultures, my point there, are guaranteed to lead to, an to a biological imbalance this is, this is something that um, in, a, in an orchard space, the simplest way to address that is to look at using the interrow. So some examples of the conservation biocontrol techniques include things like companion or interrow planting, depending on the crop environment um, in an orchard or a vineyard doing mowing alternate rows during spring. So you let some of the grasses come to flower and that can be a source of pollen that supports predatory mites well ahead of the um, the, the period where, where pest mites will, will be there in large numbers as a food source. And things like using mulches also can make sense in some crop environments. So the other, um, the other approach to harnessing biocontrol, I mentioned augmentation biocontrol, this using mass reed beneficials is now um, standard practice in many high value crops. So um, we sell a lot of bugs to, to industries like um, the berry industries uh, into 
cut flowers, hydroponic vegetables, um, now the emerging medicinal cannabis industry, also into some broadacre crops like cotton. Um, and, and certainly also um, we are working with, with the poem industry as well. There are some limitations to this approach and I want to be upfront about them. One is that mass rearing beneficial insects and mites is complex and costly. So this isn't something, you know, it's not if you are going to use augmentation by control, don't expect it to be a cheap solution. Um, releasing beneficials can also be labour intensive, just getting them out into the crop. And uh, we don't have commercially produced fire control agents available for all pests or crop environments. So you're really better off doing everything you can to make use of the natural predators and parasites and pathogens that you can, um, that you can harness and seeing this as, as the, the, next, the next tool. Um, just to mention some of the key products that are used in poem fruit, they include things like trichogramma wasps, which parasitise the egg stage of a variety of different um, caterpillar pests. So they can be used for codly moth, like run apple moth, um, heliothus, lupus, things like that. Lace wings, um, generalist predators that if you're doing the right thing with managing your spray program, you should have plenty of them in your um, turning up naturally. But there are some instances where it, where it makes sense also to, to top up those populations or introduce them. And cryptolemus ladybirds, they're, they're used for mealybug control. And then, of course, some predatory mites, the Simulus californicus and Occidentalis predatory mites are used for, for control of um, various pest mite species, primarily um, so, yeah, two-spotted spider mite. Now, there's just a little, a little video should have come on on the, the top right corner there, just showing you those cryptolemus ladybirds in a, in a jar. And the release in that case is very simple. You open the jar and you let them fly. But when you're trying to spread predatory mites, um, across, throughout the orchard, I mentioned that it can be labour intensive. It's also just challenging to get them up into the canopy. So we we do we are constantly working on improving release technologies, making this um, easier for growers. Um, and there's a little video at the bottom. Um, you'll see Nathan Roy from Aerobugs, who's working on um, on getting more efficient um, and, and reliable release um, technology to, to to get mainly mites but also things like trichogramma wasps um, into the orchard environment using that blower. He also does drone releases um, in other crops. So by controlling outdoor crops, I said a few times, and I'm saying this once more, how important that conservation by control side of it is. It should always be the starting point to optimise the performance of those naturally occurring beneficials. And then you can look in, you know, look at using the mass reared products on top of that, um, particularly, you know, perhaps to inoculate crops early in the season if, if necessary. Um, but outdoor crops really do require less or no augmentation by control due to the contribution of those naturally occurring beneficials when you compare it to what we would do in a glasshouse crop. Um, so there's some pictures of a couple of the key um, by control agents that we see in poem fruit, there's the similar predatory mite um, top left and an adult lacewing next to it on the right. Then there's something that looks like a mealybug, but it's actually the larval stage of, of the cryptolemus ladybird that feeds on mealybugs um, in the middle on the, on the left to the right of that. Um, what have you got there? I can't actually see it anymore because it's hidden. <laughs> that's right if you're if you're if you've got questions about any of these guys you can you can let me know through the chat and I'll confirm it for you later but at, at the um the bottom bottom uh left you've got stethorous ladybirds that feed on on um on on spider mites just a couple of examples there so to cultural controls, uh, this can get a bit confusing with with what I've talked about with conservation by control but I'll just clarify it's a variety of of practices that improve pest management outcomes. And they include, but they're not limited to those conservation biocontrol techniques that I've hinted at already. And these are very powerful tools, but they're often overlooked or underestimated. Um, and some examples include things like managing the interrow, so to reduce that um, dust or buffer the environmental extremes and provide habitat and alternative food for beneficials. Um, good crop hygiene is another important cultural control for quite a few pests. Um, canopy management can also be important. Weed control, um, so that might be for something like light brown apple moth, controlling some of the broadleaf weeds that, that are particularly good overwintering hosts for, for light brown or for something like harlequin bug. 
um, ant control. That's really important when you're when, um, when you're looking at something like mealybugs, um, sucking pests uh, are often associated with ants, and the ants protect those sucking pests from their natural enemies. Um, so so controlling ants can be a first step to tipping the balance in favour of natural enemies rather than the pest when you're talking about something like mealybugs or scale insects, um, aphids. And even variety selection is just another example of a pectoral control. So um, I want to talk now about pesticides. The, the principle in IPM is that we use them only as a support tool and we consider the, the impacts on beneficials, not just the efficacy against the target pest. So we're not always looking for the product that's going to um, have the highest kill rate. We're actually looking for the product that's going to, on balance, um, do the best best job, at the, you know, have the best efficacy against our target pests, but do minimal harm to the beneficials that are important in our, in our crop at the time that the spray is going to go on. And we need to think about not only um, the acute toxicity of the spray, but also whether um, our beneficials are going to be affected by secondary poisoning or some of the sublethal effects. Um, like reduced egg production or, or, um, or reduced longevity. So in terms of the impact of pesticides on beneficials, this is some, some this is a, a topic where a lot of growers who are, who are um, say, yes, we're doing, we're doing IPM, we're using lots of soft chemistry and we're conscious of beneficials, but we're not really getting fantastic results. This is where people often get unstuck that there's, um, that the information isn't readily available um, about, the, the, the specific information about the impacts of different products on, on beneficials. So it's easy with most of the old chemistry, it's broad spectrum, it's highly toxic to beneficials and there's no questions asked. We know, we know you'd have to avoid those products in most in, instances to make this work really well. But with the effects of new selective chemistry um, on beneficials, it's, it's highly variable. So lots of modern pesticides claim IPM compatibility. You just need to interrogate that because whether a product has a good IPM fit in your crop depends on which beneficials you're actually relying on. So just one example here, um, if you were looking at using Mavento spirotetramat, um, it's certainly compatible with the key beneficials in lots of field vegetable crops, but in greenhouse vegetables or in pears, it's very likely to cause mite flare. And that's because it's toxic to the predatory mites that we rely on in those crops. So um, that's just, just one example, just to show you the nuance here. It's a fantastic IPM compatible product in a whole lot of crops, but in some instances, because of that toxicity to predatory mites, um, if we're going to use it, we have to be aware that there's going to be, a, a, you know, there'll be, there's a, there's, um, there's a, there's a downside to it, and we, we might have to take extra care to, to, um, to look after um, a, a mite flare that might come up later. Just also be aware that growth regulators and fungicides can also be toxic to beneficials, so it's, we're not just looking at reviewing the insecticide or miticide program. So how do we minimise harm to beneficials? This is just the general strategy where possible, you know, we want to use application methods um, that are least disruptive to beneficials. So great, if you've got a selective product or several selective products, that's, that's the go-to, that's going to be the best option. But sometimes we don't have selective products for everything. Um, and then we could look at using baits, water spray, spot spraying, drenches or attract and kill strategies. So there's really, there's no chemical, there are very few chemicals that you, that you I never say, um, you know, there are, there, are, there, are, there are ways that we can use the whole lot of broad spectrum products if we absolutely have to. It's just always about trying to minimise their, their impact. So it's not that every, you know, that we can rate all the chemicals as good, good or bad. Um, it's more complex than that. So here I want to pull up the, um, an example pair IPM program. They're, they're, I don't want you to get stuck on the detail of it. I've listed a couple of, of key pests and just want to, to I've, I've already given you most of the detail of this, but I want to focus now on the, on the compatibility of chemicals as a last point before I wrap up. So in pairs, if you're looking at caterpillar pests, we've got a range of key beneficials. I'm not going to list them. We've already spoken about some of them, what they might be. There's a range of cultural control options that can help. So things like canopy management, maybe using mating disruption um, for codling moth or light brown apple moth, weed management, all those aspects of inter-row management that I've spoken about. And then when it comes to compatible spray options, you've got a couple of biological products at the top. So you've got 
of the granulosis virus for um, Zydex, Medex, Grandex, those um, are the trade names for, for the granulosis virus for codling off. You've got things like BTs or, or Vivus Max that you can also use for um, BTs for caterpillars in general or Vivus Max for Heliothus. All of those biologicals, they're soft. Um, they're not going to interfere with any of the key beneficials. Then you've got um, some very selective products like um, Altacora, Vallego, um, Clarentrinoliprol. That you know, there's some of these are um, also come under other trade names. So forgive me later on if they're you know I'm not listing all the trade names, but going with the actives there. And then we've got some insect growth regulators like Insigar, um, products like Prodigy and Mimic that are also um, registered for caterpillars in these crops, but are less um, commonly used. Um, but they are they are very soft, and if they if you find that they're effective enough, they can be integrated in the program. When it comes to mealybugs, um, we've got you know we've got some important beneficials there. We've got some cultural control options like um, hygiene and ant control, interro management, and we've got soft products like Applaud and Main Man. Uh, again, for, for thrips, um, we've got a range of beneficials. We've got you know interro management options that can help. And then we've got uh, a, 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 you, we've got some spray options there, which I've highlighted as orange because they're not as soft as all the others. If we're going to use products like Delegate or Entrust for thrips in pairs, uh, we need to be aware that they can flare mites. They can have impacts on predatory mites and they can also have a negative impact on populations of, of wasps that act as parasitoids of other pests. So spraying for thrips using those products, it's certainly compatible. Lots of growers do it and it's a great part of the program, but we, we need to be aware that, um, that, that it's, you know, you don't want to do it unless there's a genuine thrip pressure because you will see an impact on predatory mites and parasitoid wasps. And when it comes to, to mite pests, yes, there's a whole list of, um, of, of great selective um, miticides there that are compatible with, with the key beneficials. And bang, over here, <laughs> are all the red chemicals or some yellow ones. So what I want to illustrate here is I've gone through and checked what are all the registered products for each of these pests, um, key pests in pairs. And you can see there's a whole lot of red stuff where no one would argue with me at all about whether or not it's going to be disruptive. Um, and, and, you know, this is the, the broad spectrum old school chemistry. And then there's a few other products in there like indoxicarb, um, again, uh, what else have we got? Spirotetramat I already mentioned or sulfoxiflor transform. These orange products are ones where growers might be coming unstuck if they're assuming that they're um, that they're super soft. And um, I just want to want to highlight that this is exactly getting the understanding the nuances of, of how soft are these various selective products on the key beneficials we need in the crop. That's that's often the sticking point, the make or break for people getting exceptional or mediocre results from from trying to to um, implement an IPM program. So. I'm actually going to leave out the monitoring slide because we'll talk about it with the others. I'm going to leave you with this um, lovely bit of marketing from, from New Zealand. Um, some growers reduce insects using sprays. We reduce sprays using insects. I think it's a really nice message. Um, and I think it's it, it highlights, um, you know, just the, the positive spin on this that, that, um, that, that uh, Australian consumers are, also, you know, interested in how food is produced and the benefits of, of uh, making these sorts of changes. So that's the end of my presentation. I will stop sharing my screen and I want to welcome Jason and Brent to join me for a chat. And I'm going to ask them when they unmute themselves, I'm going to ask them to share their experiences. This is the real world bit. So that was the theory. Um, how is all of this, how does all this theory really play out in the orchard? What have you guys seen and done? And I want to start um, first with a few questions for Brent because he started one or two seasons after Jason um, and Jason's just become so relaxed about pest management and all of these things that you sort of won't believe his story unless you've heard Brent's story because it's somewhere um, perhaps a little closer to what you what feels realistic and within your comfort zone. Um, so Brent, can you tell us a bit about your motivation um, for for going down this path, making the changes that you made a couple of years ago, and what those first steps were for you? Uh, yeah, the motivation, I suppose, was uh, 
mostly that we're having having so much trouble with uh, with products not working. So putting on a lot of miticides and um, you know several blocks we're putting on three and four miticides a year. So that was what was uh, one of the bigger motivations. Um, when we started, we met with uh, Angela, Angelica and uh, Paul Horn and uh, had a bit of a chat about, uh, about what we could do, um, what products we could use. Basically, then I came up with a spray program that I thought was, uh, was beneficial to beneficials. And, um, and uh, yeah, basically, then we took out a few things, found another few products that we could use that would, would help. And uh, Angelica, uh, after that point, said, so uh, are you going to do a bit of a trial this year? And I said, yeah, let's do 750 hectares. So <laughs> we went in boots and all and, um, and really haven't, haven't looked back, uh, back since. So um, from that first year, um, I think... I think we were using uh, probably one miticide on probably, you know, 20% of our blocks. Whereas uh, previous to that, we were using, um, you know, 80% of our blocks were using at least one and up to four miticides. So that was a, a great improvement. Um, we had a, a lot of a huge mealy bug problem uh, in one pair block uh, that Angelica came up to have a look at in our first year and. Um, and that was uh, prior to flowering, and we were finding uh, plenty of mealybugs there. And and uh, at finger stage on the on the pears, Angelica said, "I've never seen that many mealybug in my life." <laughs> so, um, we we put on a couple of applauds. We introduced some uh, cryptolemus, and um, yeah, done a great job. So I'm I guess in yeah, I, I guess in terms of um, results and also perhaps the economic side of it, I guess growers sometimes think, oh, I'm going to have to spend a lot of time on monitoring these bugs or selective sprays are going to cost a whole lot. Will I be better or worse off? Can you comment at all from that perspective, Brent? Um, I would imagine I haven't done the actual cost analysis on on what extra it's costing us or less that it's costing it but it wouldn't be costing us any more for sure. Um, looking, at, looking at some of the products that we do use, they are more expensive, but we're using less products. So most of the time we're, we're not using miticides anymore. Uh, Mealy bugs, uh, we've got um, probably four blocks out of uh, how many blocks do we have? You know, 400. So the, that we've got a bit of a mealy bug issue again with this year in a few blocks. So a uh, bit of a plaud and uh, also we'll introduce some, some uh, cryptolemus again into, into a couple of those blocks. Um, but, but generally there's, there's a lot less spraying going on. And maybe just um, a, a comment about the shift from, you know, I guess routine treatments to a much more more um, a more careful approach with the monitoring and and what your you know um, how that's actually been you know what is it practical for you are you are you um, to be comfortable to not put those sprays on how much time are people having to spend out there checking? Um, well, over our over our seven hundred or well, eight hundred and fifty hectares, we've got uh, three scouts so. Uh, one scout's basically doing three different orchards. Um, they're monitoring those this time of the year uh, every second day. So they're in an orchard every second day, uh, monitoring what's going on there. The photos that I get back of, of pests and also of beneficials are unbelievable. They're, the ladies that we've got are just so um, passionate about it. And, um, yeah, just uh, the, the information that I'm getting is, is excellent. Uh, so quite comfortable with with uh, with that side of things. Um, the the biggest things at the moment that we're obviously looking for were, was thrip uh, and um, and dimple bug in apples. So thrip in pears was uh, was you know sort of up and down depending on on the blocks. And we did spray a few blocks with some delegate. Um, a few years ago, there was a question asked: Do we need to spray for thrip? Will they give us any damage? Uh, we left a block 
um, small block next to the a larger block and we sprayed with delegate and the smaller block yet did have some damage there. So if the numbers are high yet, we do need to spray. Um, as far as dimple bug goes in apples, even though this is a pear masterclass, but uh, dimple bug in apples, we, we sprayed last season for dimple bug in a couple of blocks, uh, but generally over the last four years, we haven't sprayed at all. Um, and we've seen a little bit of damage, but even in blocks that we used to spray, we'd see a bit of damage. So uh, generally after thinning and at half time, there's no damage that, uh, that goes through the pack house. I think that's a really so, important message. <laughs> that that message that perhaps don't always assume that this that you'll get more damage if you don't spray. And I don't want to say that across the board, but with certain pests like dimple bug, the sprays, um, yeah, people that have the, the guts to give this a try often find that the sprays are not as effective as they thought they were. And if the sprays are doing harm to beneficials and causing other pest flare issues later, then um, then you may be better off leaving them out. So that's yeah, it's, it's great to hear that message, Brent. So Jason, same sort of questions for you. Motivation, first steps, run us through the experience for you. Um, so like our, our motivation probably originally was probably from Mealybug. Um, and it was probably 10 years ago, I think I went to a, a, a class that Paul Horn was taking and you know, we were just talking about IPM stuff. And so we actually went down the approach of, we thought we were doing IPM, you know, we thought we were using the, the soft chemistry for probably the first four or five years, um, but we just found the, you know, supposedly the softer and more expensive the chemistry was, the more damage we ended up getting. Um, so about, I don't know, five or six years ago now, we just kind of went, well, it can't be any worse if we don't do anything. Um, you know, and that's when we, we contacted you guys directly. Um, when you were working with Paul and yeah so we we got you down and we went through the session and um, I think we were just fortunate in that first year that we decided we had a Williams block that was going to get pushed out and we decided for part of the future orchards that we're going to do a trial or get, uh, not spraying just releasing virus and um, trick of grammar and stuff like that and see what happens and you know we and in that block, we didn't put on any sprays for mealybug and the block beside it, you know, we were still a little bit scared. So we, we, did, um, we did use a supposed soft chemical in there and we come back two weeks later and they both went from one or two to where we did nothing. There was zero mealybug and where we, where we did spray a soft chemical, it went up to 17. Um, and we were like, wow. And then we spoke to the chemical company and they said, yeah, you got the timing wrong. And I said, yes, we sprayed. That was the biggest problem. And after that, we were, we were pretty much sold and committed. Um, we were like, this is the answer. Um, like for, for most pests, it makes sense. Um, you know, for mealybug, it hides in the calyx. It doesn't matter how good the chemical is, how are you going to get a chemical inside the calyx to kill it? Maybe a predator can get inside the calyx to kill it. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's where the ball started rolling because we were actually starting to get a lot of mealybug in apples as well as, as in pears. Um, and I think at that point, the year before that, or the two years before that, I think we sprayed seven different chemicals for mealybug and still had mealybug. Yeah, so it's, there, there was nothing left that we could throw at it um, sort of thing. So if you put that into context, I think I was, you know, somewhere spraying around about $3,000 a hectare on pears in insecticides and getting no, like, well, you know, and getting damage um, to we went, now we don't even spray a mealybug spray. Like Brent said, you know, every now and then we will have to spray one block for mite. Like I think in the last five years, we've, you know, there'll be, I think there's been two years where we haven't put a mite aside at all, but there'll be, you know, there'll be little patches that flare up you know, and we just have to be patient and wait and wait, and then eventually we'll go in and spray. But, you know, we've, you know, in, especially in pairs, we've reduced our, you know, chemical inputs massively. Like it's gone from a lot cheaper to spray, spraying pears than it does for apples for us. Because we're not really even using too many of the expensive ones, even though they're all expensive now, um, sort of thing. So, yeah, and for us, it's, and to the point now, I think you said, asked me the other day, are, are we seeing it? I don't even look for mealybug. 
<laughs> like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure my scouts do, but they're not sending me any pictures of them. So I'm assuming no one's finding them. I, and I'm not even, I'm so confident now that we aren't doing anything that's going to put Mealy Bug out of context. And there isn't really anything, you know, and even we used main man um, in that semi-trial where we did three rows and it still was not quite as good as doing nothing. Um, so, you know, it was still better than the other chemistry that we used, but, you know, it was, yeah. So even though it was soft, it still didn't do better than not spraying at all. So I wondered whether each of you, well, we can, I'll just check whether we've actually got, do we have some questions from the, from the chat that we want to run through? and perhaps leave it at the final question I had for each of you, but maybe we do this at the very end, is just your your advice to other people somewhere along this, this path that you guys have headed down. Um, Rose, yeah. do you want to give us some questions if there are any? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Angelica. That was a really interesting discussion. Um, we do have one question come, come in through the chat now. So if anyone else has any questions, um, either raise your hand or type them into the chat. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. So the first question that came through the chat was um, from Hassan Ramani. As we know in augmentation biocontrol, some biocontrol agents are compatible with each other and some are not. For instance, compatibility and effectiveness of Persimilis and Californicus have been studied. I was wondering if Bugs for Bugs has looked at the possibility of simultaneously um, combining several predatory mites in the field or greenhouses. The outcome might be negative on their performance or might be additive depending on the agents. Yeah, so, okay, um, it's, a good, it's a good one. Um, in, in a, it's very hard to study that sort of thing in a field crop. It's looked at in great detail in high-value um, uh, protected crops where fine-tuning all the different biocontrol agents in the mix is, is of utmost importance. But certainly just thinking about um, our experience over, you know, um, in, you know, in Australia with some of the Bugs for Bugs products, I know that we've been um, seeing really good results up in Stanford in Apple's releasing Californicus and Persimilis as a, as a program together. And I guess different predatory mites um, thrive in different environments. So Persimilis requires um, greater humidity, Californicus is a bit more resilient to um, some of the extremes in temperature and, um, and other environmental um, factors. So by putting the two of them out there together, you sort of, um, you work out who, who's going to do the job um, and, and they, they fit themselves into the niches where, they, where they're most effective. So yes, it can be done. Um, and, it's, and there are some commercial products around the world where, you know, where by control companies pre-mix um, mites and sell them as a cocktail mix or where we encourage growers to put them out simultaneously. So the short answer is yes, work is done in that space. And with the example you gave, yes, it's been it's being done currently by growers um, in Poem Fruit and the last season in Stanthorpe. They, um, yeah, it, it, it went really well. We got really good feedback from that. Um, while we're waiting for any more questions, I've got a question, um, to, I guess, to Brent and Jason. How frequently would you reintroduce any beneficials? Is that something that you do regularly or is it you've just did the initial introduction and they've established really well and you haven't had to reintroduce again? Um, with the merely bug, with the uh, cryptolamus, we introduced some on the first year in uh, only in two, in two blocks of pairs. Uh, this season is the, yeah, so three years later, uh, we'll introduce some into an apple block, uh, but we haven't introduced any um, throughout. So it's basically looking after the natural pests that are, the predators that occur. Yeah, we're the same. We, we only just the very first year brought in some lace wings, but once we stopped spraying and well, once we started using different chemistry, we, um, you know, they just are naturally, naturally there. The only place that I think um, that it, you know, maybe has a place in is like, you know, we have a lot of rows that have got cross cables that we can't get tractors and stuff down. Like I'm thinking that, you know, we can't actually spray those rows properly. So we might, and that's where we get cotty pressure or something like that, you know, releasing trichogramma or just, you know, in areas that, you know, um, you know might be valuable. 
So there are a few projects um, through AgVic and, and um, a couple of other Hort Innovation funded projects at the moment looking at inter-row plantings and, and that sort of thing. Um, do you have particular plants planted in or species planted in your inter-rows to encourage predators or is it just what grass and or no special attention given? <laughs> I don't know if there's no special attention group, but it's, it's pretty much whatever you can get to grow sort of thing. Like, I mean, we just try and grow grass, you know, and, and less weedy things like, but I think just even green, any, like as long as you've got green and you're keeping the climate cool and you're not just bare, you know, always keeping it looking perfectly pretty, you know, um, sort of thing, I think is better than nothing. We can only go, try and go to the extreme, but we can start at a, at a base point first. Yeah, yeah, I think it makes a lot more sense to look after what's what's there already. And if you have to focus any attention on managing any particular weeds that are associated with pests building up, that's worth it. But otherwise, just looking after, you know, what's what's already there is usually more than enough. Is that what you, you're the same, Brent? Yeah, the same. So, yeah, trying to just uh, mow every second row uh, a lot of the time, but uh, as far as pruning goes, and when we are late pruning and you've got a mulch to go through spraying, well, you've got to mulch every row sort of goes. So uh, you try your best, but sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah, you just got to be practical. Okay, last chance for questions. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand. Otherwise, um, we will um, close for today. So um, thank you very much, Angelica, Brent and Jason, um, for giving up your time today and sharing your experiences with us. Um, we've taken notes of what we've done today and, and you'll see more information coming out through the APAL communications um, platforms over the coming week. We hope that you found today's session useful. If you have any questions for Angelica, please contact her through Bugs for Bugs or get in touch with us at the APAL office. In the meantime, take care and we look forward to seeing you at the next APAL event.